If you live in greater Boston, our next story directly affects you. Every time you turn on a tap, take a shower, or wash your dishes, you should know it's a vivid example of government's power to take private property in the name of public good. WGBH News reporter Edgar Herwick has our focus report. Just 70 miles west of Boston is the bucolic Quabbin Reservoir, 80,000 acres of majestic views, trees, and pristine water. Cliff Reed of the Department of Conservation and Recreation says it provides clean tap water for 2.2 million people. The entire reservoir holds 412 billion gallons of water. At the time it was built, it was the largest drinking water reservoir built for that purpose in the entire world. That's right, built. The largest body of fresh water in Massachusetts was created by damming the Swift River and letting the valley flood. It was the answer to a centuries-old problem. Boston didn't have enough clean drinking water. The only problem? There were people living in the valley. There were four towns that lay in the Swift River Valley, and these had to be disincorporated. Prescott, Greenwich, Dana, and Enfield. Towns where folks shopped at the general store, sent their kids to school, and went to church on Sundays. For fun, the residents formed bands and ball clubs, and it all came to an end in 1927. That's when the state passed the Swift River Act. That gave the authority and the funding for taking the land by eminent domain of those four towns. Over the next 10 years, the state's watershed agency cleared the entire valley. Thousands of laborers removed every building, every home, every tree. Even the bodies in the cemeteries were moved. Bob Wilder grew up on a farm in Enfield. He remembers the day in 1938 that his family was forced to leave. My grandmother used to wear a bib apron, and one day she came home, and she had her hands all wrapped up in that apron, and we knew something was cooking, and she says, you know, we got to go. Like hundreds of other families in the valley, the Wilders' way of life was taken from them. My family was bitter. They were bitter, and you would be bitter if you saw our little town, and they took it away from you. They, they being this, this uh, organization uh, out in Boston, we didn't know them. Residents were paid compensation for losing their property, but Dana native Earl Cooley says that wasn't enough. Of course, they didn't get paid that much for their houses either. If they had a business, that didn't count into it. Cooley's grandfather owned the sawmill in town. My grandfather, he never recovered from it. Once they moved, he only lived about six months after they moved out of the Quabbin. You think the move killed him? I do. Richard Rohan's family was forced to leave Enfield, too. Obviously, it was very upsetting to them. They did not uh, care too much for the people of Boston. Let's put it that way. But the construction of the reservoir also provided thousands of jobs at the height of the Great Depression. Both my father and my uncles, they worked here in Quabbin for the rest of their lives, to be honest about it. So actually, it provided a living for us, too. Today, Bob Wilder and other former residents volunteer at the Quabbin, speaking to visitors from Boston about the origins of their clean water. I was one of the most bitter people, I think, that came out of the valley. And it changed because all of a sudden I realized those are human beings with families just like ours. And they had to have it. It was a necessity, and it was worth the sacrifice. Well, Emily, it really gives you something to think about yeah. next time you just turn the tap on and just get a glass of water, which you do how many times a day, and just don't even think about it. I have to say I didn't know anything about this until we started researching a, a while back. So when you actually at the, the Quabbin, do you see any remnants of the cities and You do. I mean, what's, what's interesting is, you know, it's 80,000 acres that were uh, cleared, uh, but only 25,000 of those acres is actually underwater. Uh, the rest of it's pristine land, which it has to be because they want the water to be clean. So we went back into the woods, and you're walking around around uh, not too far, and you see things like this. This is the beginnings uh, of a house, and there's the house. That's what it was. That's what it looked like. This was wow. a road in Enfield, uh, just a little ways back from where the water is now. And as you saw, it was like this beautiful home with these beautiful columns. And, and that was the now stone this wall. is what's left. Yikes. And you really go up is. into there and you can see the, the basement and you can see what was once a doorway. So wow. throughout this beautiful yeah. woods, you have these little moments where you're like, oh my gosh, people once they, lived they here. They lived yeah. here. All right, yeah. Edgar, great. Thanks for that. Well, my next guest has deep roots in the Swift River Valley. Jean Thoreau is president of the Friends of Quabbin and has ancestral ties to the lost town of Enfield. Welcome. So, Gene, did your family share the same sense of loss 
Yeah, in fact, my uh, grandfather, Walter Thoreau, grew up in Enfield, and uh, he was very bitter, and he was never the same. Uh, and both on my uh, maternal side, my grandfathers uh, were raised in Enfield, and both of them uh, went to uh, World War I and came back. Uh, and both sides of the family spent a lot of time up in Mount Washington area, and the reason why was it reminded them of their childhood growing up mm. in Enfield. Uh, that particular road there was uh, Webster Road, and actually at the Quabbin Visitor Center, there's tour books that you can borrow a book and go down there. In fact, uh, about a mile down Webster Road, uh, my granduncle, Albert Henry Parker, married Alice Maria Martindale. <laughs> and that, that particular uh, Martindale farm was oh. really pristine. And uh, that was taken down in wow. 1958. All right, let's bring another voice into the discussion. Sheila uh, Dam Kaler is the executive director of the Swift River Valley Historical Society. So today, not much is made of this. And we're talking about uh, eminent domain all this week because they're thinking of it in Somerville and Everett for the casinos. But at the time, was there a huge protest and out outcry over this? Well, there was concern and there was... Um, People did try to voice their opinions, but you know, they're small, small towns, and they really didn't have much power. They had no clout. They didn't have much power. Did they have representation? Was there anybody fighting for them, or was it just kind of like... I, I think, you know, they did what they could, and, and uh, but it wasn't enough, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people did accept it, but most people were pretty upset about it. Well, yeah. we have to keep in mind this is that... Uh, to get to Boston in those days, they, were, they would have had to take the train out of Enfield to go to Athol. So it was a two-day trip to go to Boston by train. And if you took an automobile, we didn't have the good roads we had today. So you might encounter three, four flat tires on that round trip. And uh, people were poor. And uh, they, thought, they thought up until the end that they could save their hump farms. Yeah, sure. How was it communicated, Sheila? Because... Did they get notices? How did everybody kind of, like, realize the scope of this? Gene, you might be able to speak more about that. Well, there was, uh, uh, you know, they, they didn't think it was ever going to happen, although it was rumored for a long time. Uh, Earl Cooley was talking about not getting much for their properties mm -hmm. uh, um, because they had people that were doing the assessors that were from the valley, and they were doing personalities before principals. So the property values were depressed in the first place because they knew the reservoir was coming. Secondly, is, is that it was the depression. And so those that couldn't afford it, couldn't fight, couldn't hire lawyers, they, if they didn't take what was offered to them, the next go around, they got a lot less money. Yeah, exactly. So, Sheila, a couple of years ago, a documentary film crew actually took a camera down to the bottom of the reservoir, and they, they found all kinds of things. So can you just kind of explain what we're looking at here? Do you know? Well, there were foundations down there still, I believe, and um, I've seen this movie. I'm yeah. trying to remember all of the things they <laughs> talked about. But, uh, you know, most many things were t taken away. So as much as possible, things were cut down and, t and taken away. But uh, these look like foundations mm. there. Where did all these people go, Sheila? Well, some of them went to the nearby towns. Um, others went to New Jersey, to the Worcester area. They really have gone to all over the country. And we still have many members who keep in touch and their families, their descendants keep in touch. So, um, but I think many settled in nearby communities. So one of the gentlemen told us that if you had a business, you weren't necessarily compensated for that, but a home you were. That's what I've heard also. And I, I've also heard that the compensation for the homes was pretty uneven. Some people did quite well and others really did not. Well, to give an example, my uh, great-grandfather, Fred Parker, was the executor of the state. His father owned two homes, one in the village of Enfield on six-tenths of an acre. And uh, his father was a builder. He had another home north of the village about a mile and a half outside of town, and he had 40 acres. And it was a bigger house than what was in the village. The house in the village, they were compensated about $1,500 more than the one outside of town with the acreage because the village had more, everything was right there centered. Mm. So it's complete opposite of how we would think today as far as property mm. values. Great story. All right. Sheila, Dan Kaler, and excuse me, um, Jean Thoreau, great to have you here. Thank Good you stories. for having me.